Welcome, beautiful people, to another season of Just Us. Um, we're glad that you are here with us, listening, tuning in. Um, our podcast, for those who don't know, is about ra- racial reconciliation. And Randy's going to take it off with our main verse. Our main verse comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. Make room for us in your hearts. Amen. Amen. On this new episode, we are going to summarize the last season and we're going to respond to listeners who made some comments on some of our podcasts and some of our um, on some of our podcasts and we're going to respond to their comments and their questions. So we hope you stay and tune in for that. Hello everybody, welcome to our podcast just us and uh we're each going to go and introduce ourselves uh if somebody is a new listener and we're going to share just a just a a couple uh, just a few words about why this matters to us and what we hope to accomplish through the podcast um my name is bill roberts and i've been a pastor here in western washington for many years and i i really care about racial reconciliation Because I believe that it's like it says in Psalms 133, how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. And if we want to share a message with the world that Jesus is a healer and that Jesus came to undo the works of the devil, then part of that healing is bringing us together across racial lines. And so I think this is very important. I think the world knows we're his disciples when we love each other. So that is my goal and my passion for us to come together in unity. It's hard work to understand each other and for healing to take place and for us to love each other, no matter what race we are. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, My name is uh, Randy Maxwell. And this topic is uh, near to my heart uh, because I believe that Jesus would have us reflect the kingdom of God. Um, the fact that there is uh, division and um, suspicion and racism and exploitation and all those things um, in a world that's broken in sin is not surprising. But he established a new um kingdom with new dna with new values um, when he established his kingdom and he called us to uh, be in that kingdom and he said that love would be the thing that separates us from the world and would identify us with him and so it is our it is our joy and it is our obligation to pursue and to reflect that kingdom Um, If we do not do that, then we're not able to be identified as belonging to God. And so this is something that we, um, especially as Christians, as believers, must pursue um, and and pursue joyously. My name is Mimi Withers Bruce, and um, this topic is very important to me um, because I, I echo what Pastor Bill and Pastor Randy said, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And because of that, um, we have the duty and the honor to love each other as Christ loved us. And um, that love is, in this sinful word, is not perfect, but um, that love can cast out fear. The fear of differences, the fear of the other Um, the fear of anything that is not like us or thinks or believes like us. And um, that fear obviously has caused a lot of discord um, in our communities, in our world, in our churches. And we are called to love each other. It's not always easy, but that is what we're supposed to do. And um, I I take that very seriously. And, um, And that's why I'm here discussing this. I'm John Brunt, and I believe that the issues we're talking about are really central to the gospel, that the gospel of Jesus Christ breaks down 
the barriers that our worldly cultures have created between people. And if it doesn't do that, it really doesn't have the power and we can't expect people to be drawn to it. As Paul says, in Christ, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, but all are one in Christ. And if we can't reproduce that oneness, then we simply cannot convey the power of the gospel. Amen. Amen. And my name is Hans Jusrisans. And the reason why this is so important to me is the simple fact that it's real, right? A lot of people say this is a myth. Racism is not a thing anymore, but it's real. It's a thing. It's, it's what's caused division amongst um, all of us for centuries. And uh, I think it's time for us uh, as a group of people to acknowledge the fact that it is real, that there are certain things that people are benefiting from and those are not. So here I am speaking about these things and I just want people to be acceptance of what they hear and do their own research as well. So we could all just break bread together at the end of the day. One of the things is if we're going to be family in Christ, if God's our father and we're blood brothers and sisters in Jesus, families have to have hard conversations. Closeness requires honesty and authenticity. Some of the closest people in my life, we've had painful conversations before. Mm -hmm. And so some of the things we have, we covered last season and some of the things we covered this season will make some people uncomfortable, but we believe that you can't break down the walls and the barriers unless there is honest conversation. And so we want this to be a place for it, but we also want it to be a, a place of empathy and compassion. So we're going to respond to, we have a, a list of questions and comments from our listeners. And this episode, we're going to respond. We're going to, we're listening to you. Um, and we're going to have a conversation with your questions. And so, John, you're going to deal with the first question. Yes, this question comes to us. It's a fairly short question. What about God's ability to cast away fear? Isn't Jesus enough? No one mentioned what I believe to be the real solution to the problem. And uh, pardon me, uh, I missed the line there. Um, the real solution to this problem, and all sin for that matter. Maybe this podcast was just meant to discuss the problems some more. What is my hope? Jesus. So basically, this person is saying, sin is the problem. Jesus is the answer. Why do we need to say more? Well, I would agree that sin is the problem, and I would agree that Jesus is the answer. But when I look at the Bible, when I look at the prophets, when I look at Paul, the letters he wrote to congregations, they all tended to say quite a bit about what sin is like and what it does. You see, sin penetrates into cultures, and it penetrates into our hearts in ways that often are beyond our conscience conscious understanding. And we need to evaluate and analyze and see what sin is doing in our world and in our lives. Mm. Uh, I spent the day today in jury orientation. Uh, I ended up not being selected for the jury in the end, which means I won't have to spend the next week or so sitting on a jury panel. So uh, I was a little bit relieved from that. But we did spend the day in orientation, and one of the sessions that we had to orientate, orient us to the jury process was one on unconscious bias. Oh. And it was very interesting to see the things they showed us about our unconscious, unconscious bias. One example, they had a whole group of scientists both male and female scientists, and they gave them a number of resumes, CVs, 
to uh, evaluate to see whether they think this person would be a qualified scholar that they might hire. And within those, they had two CVs that were identical. Everything on the CV was identical, except that the name on top of one of them was a male and the name on top of the other one was a female. And the group, whether they were male or female, evaluated the male CV higher than the female one, said the male was more qualified, even though they were exactly the same. Now, I don't think those people got up in the morning and said, I'm going to sin by being prejudiced against women today. It is an unconscious bias that's bred into us by the society around us and our culture. And I think that those kinds of things are sin, but we need to bring them from the unconscious level to the conscious level if we're really going to let Jesus be the solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. I just want to agree with you, John. And um, I want to say that... Uh, when we present the gospel, absolutely Jesus is the answer. I'm always the first person to raise my hand and say, Jesus, okay? <laughs> you want to know what the problem is? You want to fix it? Jesus, okay? Right. But you have to be able to identify the problem in the first place. You see, because many people, like you said, they have an unconscious prejudice, an unconscious body. They don't even know. When we look at Jesus, for instance, and his dealing with the religious people of his day, there was no uh, greater or more religious people on the face of the earth, right, than the Jews, especially the, the Pharisees, right? And they were very proud of their heritage. In fact, they felt that their heritage gave them an automatic uh, uh, ticket to heaven. And in John chapter 8, um, they um, are very proud in saying Abraham is our father. It was like, that's the ultimate answer. It's almost like saying, well, Jesus is the answer. It was like, Abraham is the answer. He's our father. And Jesus said this, if you were Abraham's children, then you would do the things that Abraham did. Mm. Okay. In other words, he says, you, verse 41, are doing the things of uh, your own father does. And he had told them that they were acting more like the devil. Okay. And so they needed to have their eyes opened to the areas in which they were blind, where they had blind spots. So we all have blind spots. I got them. I got them. I have my own inherent biases and prejudices. Yep. Yep, I do. So what do I need? I do need Jesus. But I need Jesus to reveal to me through the spirit where my blind spots are so that I can see. And that's basically what we're saying here. We're not disagreeing with the listener. The answer is correct. But we need to be able, um, like Jesus did, to um, expose those blind spots so that we can see where we're blind and then repent so we can see. Amen. I, I would also like to add on to that for those who don't um, believe in Christ or, you know, um, as we're speaking to many group of people, uh, it's understanding another person's culture or background or heritage is definitely key. That's how you allow someone, um, and another, that's how you allow people to sit down at your table and welcome them. Right. Um, you have to speak the same language, uh, or you won't understand the person across from you. So that, in that being said, um, if you are embedded to see certain ways or think certain ways and people around your community is the same exact thing. Everything seems normal to you. Right. And when you come outside of that bubble and you want to go inside someone else's um, sphere, hemisphere, whatever you want to call it, things become different and you become uncomfortable. And then you're going to see and the things that you say might be offended, uh, offensive to certain people within that um, culture. So being being well read and not, and also understanding other people's culture and background 
definitely helps because if you only one sided, you're going to miss the whole world because the world is vast with so many beautiful people, with so many intelligent ideas and um, thoughts. But if you only see your own, that's the problem. Right. So you have to be willing to be accepting and open minded to other people or else you're just going to just be in your own comfort zone and not understand anyone else but your own people or but your own comfort. I, I once brought together a group of pastors, black pastors and white pastors, and we had a conversation. I wanted to see if it would work if, and we said, we're going we're gonna to listen to each other's stories with empathy. And my brother Hans and Randy were, were part of that group. And so we talked about race and, and how that it impacted our lives. And it was so interesting to me the power of empathy, of listening without judgment, listening to people's stories. The Black pastors shared stories where they had pain of how they've been treated. And one of the white pastors, he shared a story where he was in a large city and some Black people threatened his life, and he shared his pain. Everybody listened with empathy, and I watched the bond that happened. So I think part of Jesus is the answer, but we also need to care about pain and where people have been hurt. So uh, thank you for commenting, um, each one of you, on that. We're going to move on to the next question, and this comes from in the context of episode four, where we talked about heroes of racial reconciliation and justice. And we had a wonderful young man named Almonds, uh, a young uh, black man, and this is what, who, who was a guest, and this person responded to the way I introduced him. As you talk about racial equity, introducing the young man's basketball ability as an identifier is a common stereotype, which is a microaggression. However, I applaud the conversation. I want to agree with the, with the listener. And the listener helped me. Um, I happen to be friends with this young man. And whenever he and I see each other, we talk about basketball. But introducing him like that was a microaggression because this is a brilliant young man who is at university right now studying. And so um, I want to acknowledge impact and not defend motive. The impact was the way I introduced him um, was a microaggression. And I hear that. And, and thank you to the listener for helping me to, to learn from it, to be more careful and intentional with my words. Bill, I have a question. Please. Did Almonds respond negatively to the way you introduced him? Did he express offense? He did not. Um, because Maybe perhaps because we're good friends and we always talk about the NBA whenever we see each other. And, and so, um, but he, he might, he might've noticed that maybe he was just being polite and didn't comment on it well but. here's a thought here's a thought and I, and, I, and i would love for you to ask him and to to find out i've had people for instance i i had a friend once who um and i really applaud him as a christian this is a, a caucasian gentleman that i worked with in idaho on some videos that we were producing mm -hmm. and he came to my office we're good friends and um we always joke around. He said something. I, to this day, I don't remember what he said. However, he went away and thought about the possibility that he may have offended me mm -hmm. by what he said. Mm -hmm. And it bothered him. Mm -hmm. And because he didn't want there to be anything between us, mm -hmm. he called me that evening. And apologized, and I and and I was truly um, trying to guess what he was apologizing for. And I says, "What well, what what are you what are you talking about?" And he said, "Well, earlier today I was in your office, and I said, you know, whatever this comment was, and it and and I thought later, maybe I stepped over the line, maybe I caused you offense, and I, if so, I I want 
your forgiveness. And, you know, I, I don't want that between us. And, and I told him, honestly, I said, man, listen, I said, I don't even remember what you said. I said, and I am not offended because I know you. I said, but let me tell you what, I am touched that you would think enough to call me, to want to get it right in case I had been offended. And that means more to me than, you know, any, you know, any alleged comment or whatever. I said, I sincerely appreciate that. And I, I would be interested to know um, how Almonds felt about that. Here's, here's what I would say, and maybe the other panelists have a different thought. If you didn't know Almonds and you were just having a Black guest on your um, program, mm -hmm. and maybe in his resume you happen to know it, it talked about basketball, Mm -hmm. And you included that as your introduction. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I, I, I might be tending to make that more of a microaggression, perhaps, mm -hmm. because you don't know the person. And this is an identifier that could be a stereotype. Mm -hmm. But because you have a relationship with almonds, you talk about the NBA all the time. It, it's not like you never talk about basketball, <laughs> you, you know, and you're aware that the young man is a is a ball. I, mean, I, go to, I go to his basketball games and cheer you, you for You go him. to his games. Um, I don't Along with Mimi's son. Yeah, I, I, I don't think necessarily that that's like automatically mm -hmm. a microaggression. Mm -hmm. um, if, he, if, he, if he took offense or was uncomfortable or whatever, then I'd love to know that you know, for you to have that conversation. And then, and, and then you get a or you could do like my friend did it in the event that you were, I am very sorry. I don't want anything to be between us. And I acknowledge anything that I did on my part, but um, I don't know if that necessarily should be an automatic mm -hmm. microaggression. That's just my thought. I just want to throw that into the conversation. Oh. Um, go, ahead. go ahead. Well, from yeah, the, I um, from the listener's perspective, and I agree with you, we all know the young man, you know, and you, yes, you can walk up to him and talk about basketball and it's nothing, no big deal. From someone, the listener who has no clue, you know, um, that is a microaggression. Mm -hmm. And I understand that completely. You know, someone, even people who know me, you know, and who don't know me, they, you know, I've experienced microaggressions from them, you know, things like, oh, you speak so well from, you know, you have a Caribbean background, you speak so well, I can't even tell, or, you know, it's just mind boggling sometimes. So, you know, I think you do have to look at, um, you know, the perspectives or the lens of a listener or, you know, someone in your space um, who you do or don't know. And, you know, it's um, like an identifier, you know, oh, there's a professional or, you know, a black woman or a black man coming in the in the workspace. And what is that going to mean? There's going to be anger and attitude. Those are, uh, you know, are prejudgments and they're also microaggressions. You know, if I meet someone, um, you know, Latino person and say, oh, do you do you know how to make tacos? That's an, a, a microaggression, you know, because it's an, it's an assumption. Mm -hmm. And it's a prejudgment on this person that you don't know anything about. So I understand the listener and I understand your perspective as well because of, of the relationship that you have. Right. And I, and I would say, Mimi, I agree with you um, because in those examples you were giving, you, you were talking about uh, where there is no relationship, where you don't know the person and you're making a prejudgment about what that person is or what right. they're bringing, right? Um, the listener uh, doesn't know the relationship between Bill and Almonds. I understand that, but it also points up, this is a very interesting thing that we're talking about. It points out the role all of us have, and this is where some of our blind spots come in, of, of judgment. Because we do make judgments without, yep. without all the information. That's true. So yep. the listener heard mm -hmm. microaggression, but without the information about the relationship between the two and a judgment was made and we're all guilty of it. I do it too all the time. We're constantly making judgments. And a lot of times Christians get saddled with the, uh, 
right? Is that the Christians are judgmental, but let's face it. Everybody's judgmental <laughs> and we're making judgments constantly all the time. Um, did you want to, did you want to? Yeah, on? I did. Um, I, I'm definitely jumping on um, the bandwagon of Mimi. The, for the simple fact that, um, give me a second, my dog is doing his thing. <laughs> for the simple fact that, um, even for the broad view, the broad spectrum of, of the listeners, uh, we know or we like to be labeled as, well, black people know how to play sports and this and that and third. So it is safe. And I understand the, the comment that says, OK, well, this um, to introduce that man as just a basketball player, ball player. Is, is, the, is the concept of microaggression because the broad spectrum of the world thinks, well, if you're black, you're good at sports. So in the simple fact of not allowing that to be his identity is what um, we definitely need, whether you have a relationship or don't have a relationship with the person, not allowing his skill set or what the broad spectrum of the world thinks um, to be his identity is what should be uh, the, the foremost and most safe thing. So, yeah. I actually really appreciated the listener um, giving the input. Um, it, I feel like it was done in a, a kind way. And, and then they said, I applaud the conversation. So it was a positive, but it, what it helped me to um, probably be more aware is you know, Almonds and I had the relationship, but for the listener, not knowing that, I need to, sp we're on a public forum and I need to speak towards the listener and I need to be more sensitive. So it, it made me more aware and that was helpful. To me, it illustrated the whole point of the podcast. We want to come together and grow and we can't do that unless we learn. And so I salute the listener and they're, they're taking the time to send the input and I learned. <laughs> So the next question um, comes from episode number five. And Hans, are you going to respond to that one? I am. I am. It's um, episode number five is, is entitled white privilege. Is this real? Is this a myth? What is it? And the question was many people white or black do not know where white privilege came from or come from, I guess that person meant that the history of how it comes or the history of how it came about in the country would be helpful. So I'll read that one more time. Many people, white or black, do not know where the white privilege came from, question mark. The history of how it came about in this country would be helpful. So um, huh, that's a loaded question. And the only way I could really... Um, um, what is the word that I'm trying to use? The way I could really like uh, simplify it, even though it's so loaded, is that the moment uh, colonization happened, white privilege happened. Mm -hmm. That's the, the moment people came and took slaves and colonized their uh, um, land or um, took slaves and brought it back to America white privilege was a thing. And even with the fa founding fathers um, uh, with, that wrote the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution, white privilege in that was, was, was there, was headlined. It doesn't have to say white privilege, but when they wrote, they were speaking about themselves, white men in particular, not women, you know what I mean? It's just white men. This is what they're speaking of and what they wrote. And what three-fourths of a, uh, they, they say with the slaves or whatever case might be. Three-fifths of a person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which yep. include people of color. Um, but that's that shows you the, the underlying situation. That's where white privilege, and it festers amongst the country. And it still festers today. Um, so that's the best way I could explain it. There's no like set time. The moment colonization happened, that's what it was. You could even, um, not even in America, but also in Africa, when you look at South Africa, um, certain places in South Africa, black, black people cannot go, which doesn't, like, it doesn't make sense to me. Or apartheid, all of this situation where you're in a black country and yet white privilege is superior. That, yeah. 
I think it's good to define what privilege means. And, you know, you go to the, to the dictionary and, and I have it here. It says privilege from the Random House Dictionary is a right, immunity, or benefit enjoyed only by a person beyond the advantages of most. So you can substitute person for a group of people, um, a cultural group of ethnicity, whatever nationality. And, and Hans is right. It, it's um, that definition of privilege is permeated through all of our world um, through colonization. So for example, in the Americas, in the Caribbean, in the South Americas, when African people were taken from their land and, and brought to these places, they were the privilege of reading of was taken away from them. The privilege of education, the privilege of spiritual um, cultural identity was stripped for them from them. Um, and they had to take on new names they knew nothing about that didn't match their identity. They couldn't drink from in the in the Jim Crow era. They couldn't drink uh, from the same water fountain. It's a privilege to drink from a water fountain that said white only, or to enter into the front into the front door of a movie theater or a restaurant and be served, whereas others did not have that same privilege. So it it you know it's. It's a sickening thought that this has occurred, but in a sinful world, this is what we're dealing with. And even now, um, people have the privilege of, you know, getting promoted and jobs in certain spaces where now you have to have, um, what is it called? Affirmative action come in place. So, some, so that privilege won't overtake educated people of color. Um, won't have the same opportunities as as white people do. So, I mean, privilege, I can go on and on about it, but it, it is it does exist. And even in some of our own circles, um, whether it's religious circles, there's privilege, you know, there's classism and all these other things um, that can that can go into into privilege. But when we're speaking about white privilege, you're talking about ethnicity, you're talking about, you know, race. And um, if you're putting, if I'm putting myself above somebody else um, because of what I think I am or who I think I am, um, that is a huge <laughs> problem. And if I'm uplifting myself and while, meanwhile, someone else is being oppressed by my privilege, that is a serious problem that we need to address and to speak out against. One of the things that, that people that people think of when they think of privilege is, oh, that means you were born rich. And, and that's mm -hmm. not what it means is that's mm -mm. correct is, mm -hmm. is just saying there's something called white privilege doesn't mean that all white people have things easy or that they're born wealthy. John and I have talked before, although we are white males, we both were raised in um, lower income homes or, or at least not, not higher income homes. And I think of a privilege Mimi, you and I live in the same housing development and I often go walking at night after dark. Now my daughter can't do that. That's a privilege, a male privilege. And so it's not like it's something I, I'm taking away from her. It's just not safe or that opportunity isn't, isn't available for her. I understand. Right. Yep. And I was going to use that example as well. Um, but before I want to recant um, a word I use, I said superior. I don't believe anyone's superior over another being. Rather, um, instead, yeah. uh, instead of superior, I will use white extremeness. Um, but to further on to the conversation, right, like there's so many privileges as, as you, because sometimes I just take my dog for a walk and just um, at 12 o'clock at night for his last walk. And I'm just sitting there brushing up. I'm like, yo, a woman, my sister can't do that. You see what I'm saying? A woman cannot um, do that. I, there was something I was reading and it said, uh, so this is, this is engaged to women. It was like, if there were no 20, if there were no men for 24 hours, women, what would you do? And this woman replied, she goes, I will go outside for a run at night. I was just like, wow there's a privilege that we have that they don't you understand that so even though you don't think you have the privilege you do and especially as a um white privilege white male privilege is beyond what a lot of people have 
you don't see it because you might be blinded by it. It might be normal when you don't t- take it as, as such, but there is a privilege. When I read that, I'm like, wow, she, she doesn't even want to go for a walk, I mean, a run at night. Like I'll go for a run at night. I walk my dog at night, but that's, that's something that we definitely need to think of. Randy, would you tell, would you share the illustration that I've heard you talk about what it's like for you to get on an elevator versus me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i just i think I've, I've i've shared with this group that as a black man if i get onto an elevator and there happens to be a white woman in the elevator um i am very much on guard uh of how i seem to that person because I don't want to put them on the defensive. I don't want to give them any reason to think I'm being aggressive or that they need to be afraid of me. So that thought, just the thought of having to be sure that I am not posing a threat is something that a white male probably would not think about. That wouldn't be a thought. And that's where what we're talking about, the privilege comes in. It's that there are certain things that the majority culture does not have, does not come into the consciousness because it, it's not a part of their world. Whereas people of color have to take in account other thoughts, other awarenesses. I mean, th- 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 this is brand. I mean, I was just in, for instance, um, <laughs> I, I was just in um, uh, the eastern part of our state here in Washington and close to the Idaho border, the northern Idaho border. Now, understand what I'm about to say, because I spent 28 years of my life in southern Idaho. And so it's very familiar to me. It's home. I'm OK with it, even though the black population is like less than one percent. OK, I get it. But historically, historically, there has been more racial divide and issues the further north you come up to the state. So you, you, you get towards in the Panhandle, you get towards Coeur d'Alene and those areas. And historically, things have been different. I mean, the Aryan Nations had their headquarters on Hayden Lake, okay, up in that area. So just recently, within like two weeks ago, I was in Coeur d'Alene area with my wife, and we were there for a wedding, to perform a wedding. And um, we, <laughs> we were driving through certain parts of Coeur d'Alene, whatever, at night. I was conscious <laughs> of my situation and mm-hmm. being very um, alert so as not to break any uh, driving rules <laughs> to get pulled over. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm just saying that there are certain things that we think because of history that others don't have to even give a second thought to. That's all. Now, nothing happened. Nothing happened. There was no negative incidents. But I'm telling you, the thought processes Mm -hmm. that you go through because of history and where you are, who you are, and Mm -hmm. you're just on high alert. Whereas Absolutely. you would go, you would drive through that area and wouldn't think twice. And the only way we can empathy and, and sharing stories is the only way it can open my mind because I've never, you know, when I heard you share about getting on the elevator, I'd never thought about that. But when I, but I heard it in your voice, there's something about the tone of voice. I heard it in your voice, Randy, and it opened my eyes to reality. And I think that's, as a Christian, I want to be, I want to care about other people's stories. And I want to have empathy for their stories, because I think that's what brings us together as, as, a, as a family. Any last comments on, on that subject? Anyone else want to chime in? So Mimi, Mimi you're going to deal with, the, our, with our last comment. Okay, yes. Now, this last um, comment was under our episode seven discussion on racial racial reconciliation and justice 
in the workplace. And um, the guest was, I believe his name was John. I don't remember his um, last name now, but his name was John. He was a guest. And this is this comment from a listener is long. <clears throat> so I'm going to do my best to read through it quickly because I believe we should read the listener's comments in its entirety um, for context. So again, the topic for episode seven was racial reconciliation and justice in the workplace. And um, Jean was um, a guest and he was talking, he was discussing his um, experience in the corporate world. And here is a comment from a listener. Meanwhile, BIPOC communities, which is BIPOC means um, black and indigenous people of color, BIPOC communities are being killed at disproportionate rates because of racism, not just killed, but mistreated and traumatized throughout our American legal system, foster care systems, and many other institutions that were built on racism. Yet, they're the ones who are portrayed as evil in the media and in our bias. In fact, BIPOC communities aren't allowed to get mad because it's then considered evil because they want to overcome evil with good. I do not mock the Bible, but we, white people, hold the BIPOC communities to higher standards. Why is that? As white people, we don't have to think about these things, our actions, thoughts, words, or questions, because this world was made for us by us. It benefits us regardless of what we do. So why would we have to think about our actions? We're not the ones being mistreated by the entire society based on how we look, because it was built to benefit us regardless of what we do or how angry we get. White people need to start changing that. The question comes from a place of privilege. No matter how good the intentions were, white people have never and will never experience what BIPOC people go through every single day. So why do we hold BIPOC communities to the higher standards? In fact, why don't we create safe spaces for our brothers and sisters to process their emotions rather than telling them, to hone in on their anger or other emotions because what, it's too much? I'm not saying to let people overcome by evil, but after centuries of oppressing groups of people and inspecting them to not be mad or to feel any emotions towards their unjust history and current day tragedies, it's also a form of oppression and it's also just messed up. White people have a job to, dis to dismantle the system that was created and reinforced by our ancestors ancestors to oppress entire communities of people. And that starts with understanding that our fragility to these issues also is also part of the problem because it prevents us from dealing with the issue and furthers our time to dwell in the evil of white supremacy. No one has ever been fragile with BIPOC communities. The least white people can do is listen to someone's, someone else's frustrations with the world without vilifying their emotions as evil. BIPOC communities have every right to be angry and to feel the emotions that they feel because it's white people that need to be making the necessary changes to our society, not them. We are the oppressors, we hold power and we benefit from it. So we need to make these changes no matter how hard it is going to be. Our God is not a God of comfort. Woo. Well, that person killed it, that, that's yes. beautifully said. And, Indeed. And I know I know you don't want to answer that question, but before I just want to give the flowers where the flowers are due. The simple <laughs> fact that this person um, understand their privilege as a white person, um, it's that's what an ally looks like. Mm -hmm. Not yes. a savior, but an ally. And what was written, what, what this person said is by far one of the things that's so enlightening as a white person that, that I'm like, wow, you understand, right? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to give that, uh, those, those flowers to that person. Yep, applause for that. It, yeah. it was, uh, I wouldn't call it a rant. I would just say it was a very clear and well thought mm -hmm. out statement um, from the listener. And it summarized, it summarized everything that we just, that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. here um you know microaggressions privilege <clears throat> and one thing i that that struck me about what um this listener said is that uh pe bipoc people aren't supposed to be angry when they are oppressed and because all of a sudden the victim 
becomes the evil person mm. for expressing that anger and frustration. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and I, I can understand that um, very well. You know, someone does something to you at work or wherever you are. And if you express yourself or get angry, you're labeled as the, you know, the angry person or, mm. you know, whatever it is. And I experienced that firsthand. You, you can't react because reacting is making the oppressor uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I spot on, and I believe um, the last statement this listener said is, our God is not a God of comfort. I'm going to take that. God is a God of comfort. I agree in that it means he, God wants us to push us out of our comfort zones, mm -hmm. you know, and our privileges and our biases. Um, so we can look at, in the all throughout the Bible, it tells us, you know, how we're to speak up for the poor, the oppressed, the, mm -hmm. you know, those who have experienced unjust, you know, circumstances, um, you know, to take care of the widows and the orphans and love the stranger, welcoming them into your land. And we don't do that very well. And, you know, come out of our comfort zones and, and you know, ask questions, be curious and love people so that this gospel that we have can be preached to every nation, tribe and tongue. Mm -hmm. And that is also um, what we're called to do as Christians, believers, and followers of Christ and dismantle these systems of oppression and sin that were built up. So um, all these listeners had, you know, something very powerful to say and to comment on um, and to get us thinking as well. And what are our next steps and what do we do, you know, as brothers and sisters and how do we continue to move forward to, to, um, to tear down you know, these strongholds. And one of the things I definitely want to um, highlight is that this, the comment, the listener challenged her community. She, mm -hmm. uh, the listener said, um, what are we as white people going to do? Yep. And that's, that's where it starts. It starts with white people dismantling. I, I, it, didn't, it wasn't like, oh, black people have to dismantle this um, system. No, this person says, um, white people have to dismantle um, the system so it could be on equal playing fields. So this is what this is how we could further um, the future, like become one with one another and not have this racist bias and see like, OK, I do have this privilege or I'm, I am blinded by by certain things. And this is not OK. So we have to change that. Going back to the founding fathers. Right. It was white men that was in that room writing these laws. So now if when we all come together, <laughs> dismantle it, have different people from different backgrounds, from different worlds come together to say this is how it should be. And so I, I, I really like that. That whole segment, what that person wrote is beautifully said and well written and it challenged people to do better rather than just hear. And that's what we need to do. We need to challenge one another and come together and do that work rather than just talk. You yes. know, it is always misplaced to blame people for their emotions because we don't choose our emotions. We choose what we do with our emotions, but we don't choose our emotions. Um, they're there. They're spontaneous. And so often we will say things like, you shouldn't feel that way. Well, whether you should or shouldn't, you do. And it seems to me what <laughs> getting at when it talks about love is that we don't blame people for their emotions, but we empathize. We weep with those who mourn. We rejoice with those who rejoice. We listen to those who are angry and feel with them in their anger because feelings are not something that we choose. They're there, and we aren't going to make any progress till we understand why they're there and empathize, and then we can begin to find real understanding between people. Absolutely. This, what's interesting is I, as I listened, Mimi, as you read this person's comments, I could tell this person had reached out and listened to other people's experiences. Mm -hmm. and, and that's pretty powerful. 
um, because this person was going outside their own realm of experience, but you could tell mm-hmm. they, they had listened. And, you know, you, we, t- we started out by talking about what's at stake. And, um, you know, I think of uh, a horrible uh, situation that took place in Charleston at the Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church, where uh, a very disturbed young man went in with a gun mm-hmm. and, killed, and killed people. But what what's interesting to me is before he did that, he had been online listening to a lot of hate material. And so uh, that's one reason why I think the this podcast and things like this are so important is there's a lot of darkness out there and we need to, we need to hold up a light. There's a different way and we yeah. can love people and yeah. hate isn't the answer and fear is not the answer. Um, yeah. Bill, I, I want to challenge you on one of the things that you said, and I, I know you, that, that's why I'm challenging you. Never other hesitate people, to do that. Right. Other you people learn. would be like, why did you just call this young man disturbed? Other people would call this the young man a monster for doing what he did. So I just want you to just be out there and say what you like, because um, in the news, as we see, whether it be CNN, Fox, how, whatever news you listen to, whenever there's a white man doing something, it's mentally ill, he's sick, mm-hmm. he's he, 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 he broken home, whatever the case might be, and they label them disturbed or whatever mentally ill. Well, us, it would be different words, choices, whether it be gangsters, thugs, however they may be. So I definitely want to challenge that statement once more. I, I hear that, Hans, and I, I received that. Um, yeah. I received that because he was feeding on on hate. You're he evil. was right. He, he was evil. He was he had gone to the dark side. There's there's no question. I, I received that and and you know that we're only going to learn if we're candid with each other. So never hesitate to to uh, I receive that. I do. And it's true because a lot of times, if it's um, you know a white person shooting up a school or something heinous like that, it's a rogue person you know a lone wolf but then you know if a black person or another person does it they them you know it's a collective problem now right those them they and it's plural so we do have to and and it's 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 in our it's in the news cycles it's systemic how the language defines individuals when it comes to certain you know crimes or acts or whatever so yeah, we do have to call it what it is. Yeah. If you're a monster, you you you're a monster, and that's what you've done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we we are uh, as we look forward to our second season of our podcast. Um, we have um, been working on topics. One of the topics we want to address going forward is do's and don'ts to to understand. Um, as we interact cross-culturally with each other, what are the do's and don'ts and what are the areas um, Hans shared a story the other day? We'll get, we'll get to probably, you know, of something that happened. And um, so another topic we want to talk about is what does the Bible say about slavery? Because some people have, have um, defended with that. We want to take a look. What does the Bible actually really say and and um, another thing we want to talk about that's very relevant now is Asian people are being mistreated. And so we're going to talk about how um, racial um, animosity and the need for reconciliation, it goes to the heart. It's a sin problem and it's a heart problem. So uh, we look forward to next to this coming season. We, we care deeply about this, and we want to learn, and we want to grow. We encourage you to communicate with us, uh, to my partners and friends. Any last words any of you wants to say? I would say um, definitely tune into this new season. However, if you have missed the previous season, just go back and listen, and you and just, yeah, be informed and to with the things that we spoke about, if you're really interested, yeah, it's, it's, it's there. So there's links. It's on um, YouTube. So if you like to see, then you can see it. It's on any um, form of podcast. So just enjoy. And leave comments and definitely ratings. Yes. Thank you. We appreciate your support, all of you who listen. 
um, and who value the conversations. Amen. Thank you. Yes, and do talk back to us. Do, and we always we always like to go back to what this is all about. Second Corinthians seven to make room for us in your hearts. Thanks for being with us, and we look forward to um, our continued season. Please join us. Have a blessed day.